Hello, I'm Professor Claire Chambers from the Department of English and Related Literature at York. My title today is Food for Thought, A Culinary and Cultural Journey Across Muslim South Asia. During the pandemic, at a time of survival and restaurant closures, there's been a lot of talk about food, particularly South Asian food. Let's start with a bit of an unexpected example. What does the star of Rain Man and Top Gun and controversial Scientologists have to do with it, you may ask. Well, last August, while he was filming Mission Impossible 7 under strict COVID protocols in the UK, he went to Ash's restaurant in Birmingham. Unfamiliar with British Asian cuisine, he liked their chicken tikka masala so much that as soon as the actor finished, he ordered a second one. On Twitter, this spawned the nickname Tommy Two Tickers. Curry is often hailed today as Britain's national dish. A generation earlier, in his chicken tikka masala speech of 2001, the late Robin Cook, then the UK's foreign secretary, remarked on the dish's national importance and assimilatory tendencies. The British, he said, absorbed and redefined South Asian cuisine, adding that the masala sauce was added to hybridize traditional chicken tikka because of the British penchant for meat in gravy. Jumping back again to late August last year, a row erupted in America when Jean Weidengarten, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, listed, quote, Indian food, unquote, as one in a list of food he just wouldn't eat. He lumped all of India's food together, saying it was the only ethnic cuisine in this world insanely based on one spice, end quote. What the spice was, was anybody's guess. The curry leaf tends to be used more in South Indian cuisine and certainly isn't universal. Nor are ch chili, turmeric, and, and strictly speaking, turmeric actually shouldn't go with fresh coriander, even though that often is the case. Or garam masala, none of these dishes are pan-Indian spices. So affronted was the top chef presenter and Salman Rushdie's ex, Padma Lakshmi, that she came up with this wonderful curse directed towards Weingarten. She said, may your rice be clumpy, roti dry, your chilies unforgivable, your chai cold and your poppadon soft. That same month, food blogger Shaheti Bansal joined the debate, thinking through the very nomenclature. She told her audience, curry shouldn't be all that you think about when you think about South Asian food. You can travel like 100 kilometers and you can get a completely different type of cuisine, a completely different language and a different culture. It just goes to show that there's so much diversity in our food that doesn't get recognized. This was reported in the Daily Mail as being a woke commentator calling for the word curry to be canceled. But Bansal is right that curry is far too vast an umbrella term that the British impose with violence on an extremely diverse cuisine. Say curry in the Indian subcontinent and it won't get you very far. Are you talking about bhatis, salams, kormas or kalias? To take just a very few examples. As a food lover and an expert in South Asian literature, during the pandemic, I edited a book, Desi Delicacies on the subject. It comes out of an AHRC Global Challenges funded research project, Forgotten Food, Culinary Memory, Local Heritage and Lost Agricultural Varieties in India. The principal investigator is historian Professor Siobhan Lambert Hurley from the University of Sheffield. What underpins the project is the idea of academics, which is historians, literature scholars and plant scientists, working together with practitioners like writers, influencers, filmmakers, performers, chefs and foodies. Siobhan contributed my books afterward, which she appropriately called a dessert. In it, she wrote, food can divide us, but also bridge the gaps. Over a meal or even one dessert, friendships are forged and a lifetime of adventures launched. I agree wholeheartedly with this. Communal eating is a superb way of breaking down barriers and bringing different people together, especially in contexts where caste and religious scruples often prevent such exchanges. As Akbar Ahmed writes, Islam is sharing your food, end quote. Moreover, as Pakistani writer Bina Shah suggests in her forward to the volume, memories of love, 
and fellowship seasonal food, infusing particular meals with much more than the sum of their ingredients. Many of the contributors to my volume, including but not limited to Rana Safi, Tarana Hussain Khan and Farah Yameen are project partners from India. Others among them are people I knew from my long relationship with Pakistan's literary scene, or from my newer and growing interest in Bangladesh, where I went for the first time to Dhaka in 2015. As the project developed, contacts seemed to snowball with authors recommending other people they knew to be good writers who were also interested in food. In the end, we collected together nine essays and nine short stories. Each of the 18 pieces is accompanied by a recipe and a black and white illustration. You can see from the map the wide diversity of locations. At a time when flights were grounded because of the pandemic, the 18 essays and short stories collected in the book enable travel of another kind, as the contributors established and emerging authors from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kashmir, the UK, Denmark and the US explored the issue of food in Muslim South Asia and its diasporas. The book was reviewed for the most part very positively with interviews in various places, including the Times of India and BBC Radio and appearances at the Lahore and Hyderabad Literary Festivals. But my favorite quote is this one from Suresh Bhattacharya in India's The Daily Guardian. He calls Dirty Delicacies a smorgasbord of the subcontinental culinary tales that will prove to be invaluable to our understanding of why what we eat defines who we are. By this point in the presentation, you may well be asking what makes me someone who's interested in these issues. Well, my interest in the literature of the Indian subcontinent and the Muslim world was originally ignited by the year I spent prior to university teaching in Peshawar, Pakistan. And let me show you some pictures. Um, so this is me when I was 18 and I was a bit of a goth. Um, and you can see that a lot of my memories revolve around food. So I was teaching English, you can see in the top right, um, there I am with four of my pupils. Many of them were Afghan refugees because Peshawar is just 30 miles from the border. Um, but you can see in the middle top that um, the family um, and the other English girl that I lived with, we often went on picnics. There we are eating Pani Puri in Lahore. And bottom left, that was the family that I lived with. And I just remember so well that dining table and the mosquito nets on the window and the wonderful food because hospitality is such an important part of South Asian culture, but especially in this Northwestern region. The middle picture is from Swat Valley where Malala is from, which became very war-torn, but it's absolutely beautiful. And that's another of our picnics. And the bottom right was a meat fest, um, kebabs um, for, the, for the visitors from England. So I just developed a passion that continues to be informed by return visits to the region and by working with diasporic communities. Iske alava mahamari ke doran me hindi si ho. So what I said there was I've been learning Hindi since lockdown started. And photos of, of some of my food experiences in Pakistan, as I say, are on the slide. But let me now give you something of a flavor of this book, Desi Delicacies, which it's, it was published in India, but then we had a British version. So if you are interested, it was published as well by Olden's Beacon Books in the UK under a different title, Dastakhan, which is the cloth that you sit on to eat in Muslim South Asia. I consciously tried to disrupt popular simplistic cliches where Muslim food is automatically associated with halal meat, such as biryanis and kebabs. Even though as my previous picture showed of the man, the gentleman having made us kebabs, that this is, you know, it is a true representation, but it's also very much exaggerated. Vegetarian fare like spinach with fenugreek, sarg, samosas, kelias, bartis, and the pictured kali dal or black dal came up a lot. So it is, you know, day to day, people eat a lot of vegetables, but for feasts, you know, meat is there. Other than the assumption that all South Asian Muslim food is rich and meat heavy, my writers were keen to bust stereotypes, like that of this docile, downtrodden wife, making the perfect gold roti or round chapati for her domineering husband. Of course, such pressures do exist in some Muslims' marriages, as well as those of other religious groups. But 
essays look at, for example, there is an essay which mentions the queer eyes Tam France, who makes far rounder chapatis than many women could manage. And in Pakistan's first Aurat, or Women's March, a key slogan was Khud Khana Garam Kalo, which means heat up the food yourself. And writers, they, they express gender politics in these stories, which often go against what might be expected, like fathers, single fathers, cooking and caregiving for her, for their loved ones, which comes up in a couple of stories. Now, the young British Pakistani novelist, Savat Hassan, really um, went to town with her stereotype busting. Not only did she write about Kali Dal, the, the black doll that I was showing, but also pasta, a taco party, a snow day stir fry, and so on. So she refused to be pigeonholed. She was asked to write about food, and she's a British Pakistani, so she wrote about all different cuisines. And her essay is all about food and sensual enjoyment. And she advises us to, and I quote from the slide, put the music on that you like the most, that no one else shares the love for, Whitney Houston, Dolly Parton, and sing along badly to it. But there's a darker side to food than this, and it is one that Tabish Kerr takes on in his essay on caste, class, and cuisine entitled Juta. One of the Danish Indian's author's concerns is the vicious assault that Muslim communities have experienced on their food cultures in contemporary India. This assault has resulted most devastatingly in so-called beef lynchings, accompanied by the closure of slaughterhouses and meat shops on which so many depend for their livelihood. Here's an illustrative quote from the essay. If pork was forbidden to us, the permitted consumption of beef as recent lynchings of Dalits and Muslims on the mere suspicion of killing a cow highlight come with great risks. One of my favorite essays in the volume is by Sally Kamal, who is actually a PhD student of mine at York and a very talented upcoming writer. Her essay concerns her difficulty as a millennial migrant in reconciling her identity as a feminist in a culture where women's roles remain somewhat rooted in the kitchen with being a woman who simply enjoys cooking and revels in exercising her choice to do so. As a feminist myself, who also enjoys cooking for the joy of it, but feels very strongly about this not being associated with any de desire for domesticity, I can understand her dilemma. She writes, Perhaps I should have eschewed cooking. Perhaps that would have been the more, fem more obviously feminist thing to do, I think sometimes. But then I remember that feminism is about choice and it's my right to make this one. Still, I feel guilty at the privilege that has bolstered my right to choose, even as I am angry that most women do not get to choose. The other four senses are hard to separate from the fifth sense, which has been under discussion in this presentation, that of taste. Take smell, for example, which has a particularly close relationship with taste. When a person has a blocked nose from a cold or has lost their sense of smell due to coronavirus, their enjoyment of food diminishes. For the unafflicted, tantalizing aromas from a meal being cooked often add to anticipation and pleasure in its eating, but there are differences too. As Usma Aslam Khan puts it in the book, smell was a private mystery, taste was better when shared, then it became ceremonial. To conclude, the kitchen is often the heart of South Asian homes. Muslim South Asian kitchens in particular are the engines of an entire culture. What Bina Shah in her forward to the book calls the alchemy that takes place within these kitchens affects nations and economies, politics and history, and of course, human relationships. I hope there is proof of it in Desi Delicacies or Dastakran, the anthology I edited of essays, stories, and recipes supplied by some of South Asia and the diaspora's most well-loved writers, historians, and chefs. Thank you.